Hi, I'm Scott. Um, I work at G Research in the Cloud Engineering Department. Uh, my main sort of role is to sort of deploy OpenStack and Ironic and all the fun that comes with that. So, yeah, who are G Research? We're a fintech company uh, based in London and Dallas. And what we do is we try to, uh, we have a bunch of quantitative researchers that will try and um, create algorithms to, um, to get movements in financial markets and then we trade against that. So uh, we build a big research platform for the, the, the quants um, to build their models on and sort of try and predict how the, mar how the markets are going to move. And then we're in the process currently of moving away from Windows and HC Condor over to like a full like Linux and Kubernetes and open stack, um, an open source sort of stack. So this is a bit of a high level view of our architecture. Um, it's pretty high level. Um, I won't go into everything. Um, what we, uh, so some of the main services we use is Ironic for a start. So in there we have Inspector, uh, the Pixie and the Conductors. So uh, to, build, to build the bare metal nodes, um, we, yeah, we make quite heavy use of um, things like Inspector and Pixie. Uh, and essentially what happens with an Ironic node is you, t you turn it on, um, it will pixie into a, a round disk image and it will have a bunch of like preloaded scripts in there that it will run to do different tasks. And then if we move into the middle, we've got Neutron. So to move a bare metal node from network A to network B or like the provisioning network to say the tenant network, we use a networking generic switch. Um, and then, yeah, this essentially allows you to uh, SSH into a switch or use an API or whatever you need to do, however you need to interact with the switch. Um, NGS is kind of the plugin that we use. Um, and then if you have like a, uh, if, you, if you have a vendor supported a plugin, then that's great. But if you don't, then network and generic switch is kind of a good thing to go in there. And also if you, um, if you have multiple vendors like uh, in your switch layer, then um, network and generic switch can sort of allow you to have one, one plugin to sort of rule them all. And that's, that's exactly what we do. Um, yeah, so you, you basically just supply it with a bunch of commands um, what it needs to do to actually move from one access VLAN to the next and it will kind of do the, it will do the rest for you and you don't really have to get too involved in kind of neutron in, ins and outs. And then we have Nova. So typically when a user builds um, a bare metal node, they don't actually interact with Ironic directly. Um, what they actually do is they just interact, interface with Nova and then that allows them to have a, uh, like a consistent workflow between moving from VMs over to uh, Ironic. So all the, essentially all they have to really do is just change the flavor. Um, and then, yeah, it's hopefully nice and easy workflow for them. So yeah, at the top of the diagram, we've got uh, Terraform and Jenkins. So we run pretty much everything via automation. Um, and then, yeah, so Jenkins pretty much runs all the orchestration side of things and then users will interface with Terraform. So, Digging a little bit deeper into the architecture, we make pretty heavy use of things called conductor groups. So uh, in, a, in a conductor group, you can sort of think of that as uh, like a collection, of, um, a collection of ironic nodes. So here in the diagram, you see we've got three AZs and then we've got up to 1,000 bare metal nodes uh, in there. So the way that typically works is, um, the, so the, the stuff on the previous slide, you would see that split between sort of one or three AZs depending on the size of the, the size of the hall, how much room we've got. But the thing we do different with conductor groups is we then would split those up into like an AZ uh, with a set of conductors and up to a thousand nodes. So that would map to something like a pod in a data center. And when I say like a pod, I don't mean a Kubernetes pod. I mean like a collection of like racks and cooling and all that fun. Um, so we, we're piling about a thousand nodes into one of those and then that will allow us to keep it all siloed um, and then yeah uh, and then we kind of reduce our blast radius and things like that. So uh, one other thing it helps us do is when you uh, when you roll out your changes you can kind of do this like one AZ at a time so in a typical data center say we had like five or six pods, um, we can roll that out one at a time. And if we, if we make a breaking change, then we'd only take out a fifth of the infrastructure at, at one time. So into Ironic, the, the four main things we care about in Ironic, or well, we should, we, when we look at Ironic, the four main states that we, we really care about is enrolling, cleaning, holding, and provisioning. Uh, there are some transitional states in between there, but we won't go into that for now. Um, and so when a bare metal node is 
is provisioned, it's given to the user, and then when it's deleted, it's cleaned, and then it's removed back into the holding state, and then it should be clean, and it should be as the same state that it was before um, it, was, it was taken by the user, and then it's ready for the next person to, um, to pick up. So we do use this feature a lot in GR. We, we, we try to have our nodes handed back for once a month, um, there, and that is, that's done today. Um, so the user will take the nodes, they use it, um, it will usually have like Kubernetes or like be a Kubernetes work or something like that. And then it will come back, it will get cleaned, it will get put into the pool and then they pull something out of the available pool. And that cycle just continually happens all the time. So digging in a little bit deeper, we've got enrolling. So when a machine is rolled into the data center, uh, it's first enrolled, and then we have this pre-inspection phase, that's what we call it, so it's before we actually go into ironic inspection, we, um, uh, we do this pre-inspection uh, phase, so we create the record of the machine in the ironic API, uh, we set the resource class, we uh, reset some BIOS to baseline settings, uh, it's just really for consistency, and we also set the, the baseline configuration of the BMC or the, the ILO or the Dirac or whatever it is. So th there you can see that on number two there's a resource class, so if anyone doesn't know what a resource class is, it defines like a type of hardware, so you'd say I've got this set of model server, it's got four disks in it, they're all of X size and it's got this much RAM, it sort of defines a piece of hardware. Um, and then what that allows us to do is when we get the, get the, uh, the hardware in, we can kind of allow us to confirm we got what we paid for, for a start, and then we can make sure that things that are going in are consistent, so they've got like consistent minimum ver ver uh, versions of hardware, uh, so uh, firmware, we uh, reset the, the BIOS so everything sort of looks the same. With this stuff, if you do lots of the same thing, it kind of scales quite well. Um, so like setting it all here and making sure that everything's consistent really like sort of saves you a lot of time over, over, um, over the long run. And then, yeah, um, on that point, I'd, I'd kind of rather say that it's quite good to make this quite opinionated, this sort of section, because if you can get the stuff into Ironic and it's all consistent, Ironic does a really, really good job of looking after things after that. And if you're not checking that you've got all the disks that you enrolled and then you get your end user, they spin it up and they go, where's two of the disks? It's not great, so if we make this a little bit harder to get things in in the first place and make sure that everything is exactly what we want before we go and throw it into the farm, then we make sure that yeah, everyone's happy in the long run. So yeah, once, once we're ready to go, we've got a record of it in Ironix. So we've done our OpenStack bare metal node create. Uh, the machine's ready to be inspected. So inspection is where the machine is turned on and then booted into the RAM disk. The IPA will then run a set of scripts, as I said earlier, and then the machine will discover exactly what's there. It'll say like how many NICs we've got, uh, what's, yeah, what's the CPU model, and then it will post that back to the Ironic API. And then what we can do with that afterwards is we can make use of things called inspection rules, and then we can verify that um, everything that we, the assumptions that we're making about the hardware is there. So is it, uh, has it got the, the correct name on switch A and switch B as its switch port um, description? Is the MTU right? Um, uh, yeah, just all things like that. Check for cabling issues. If it's, if it's plugged into one port on the A side and another port on the B side, then there's probably a cabling error there. And yeah, we tend to find quite a lot of those um, going through. And yeah, it's really good to just get out of the way at the beginning because as soon as you throw network and generic switch in, in there and you're going in, you're logging into switches and you're changing access ports, you want to make sure you're changing the right access ports and you're not just changing stuff willy-nilly. So yeah, um, once, we get, once we get all this information from inspection, we can do the next part, which is to create the bare metal port. And then this means that network and generic switch has enough information to actually move the machine. So before, when we, uh, when we boot the node up for inspection, we need to make sure it's on the right network. Um, and then, because network and generic switch doesn't actually know what to do, it will discover that when it does the inspection. So the, the node just gets powered on, we do inspection, we check the, uh, the inspection rules, and then we can store that information as a bare metal port, which will allow us to move on to the next part, which is cleaning. So cleaning in Ironic is a set of tasks that allow you to recycle a machine back to a known state. So the tasks are ordered by priority. The lower the number, the higher the priority. It kind of sounds a bit weird to say that backwards, but uh, yeah. But the lower the number, the higher uh, its priority is. So we build, uh, we've built our own custom hardware manager that allows us to plug in our own cleaning steps uh, without forking the main Ironic code, which is great because maintaining forks is not 
great for when you want to do an upgrade. So uh, yeah, Ironet does a good job at allowing us to plug in our own hardware manager. And then we can do things like um, set, setting the, um, the hardware clock using NTP, verifying that the firmware is as we expect. Um, we can then update the firmware, and then we can wipe the hard disks. So there are, uh, there are things in Ironic to allow you to like, wipe the hard disks, but one of the things that we do is we use an external encryption device, which will give you a bunch of encryption keys. Um, so if you try and zero out a, a hard disk, and it's a spinning disk, and it's quite large, and it's a big data node, that might take you a few days, where what we do is we have written our own um, uh, cleaning step, which interacts with our uh, encryption device and just rotates the keys, and then it's super quick, and then it can get it back to the users. So yeah, this is, this is quite good. And then uh, also like things like setting the NTP, and, and that, uh, um, that's just more for the consistency point I keep plugging in. Um, like consistency really is the most important thing. Um, and then, yeah, lastly, we, can, we take that new storage once we've configured the, um, the new keys, and then we can set up any RAID config that the users, uh, that's defined in the resource class. So yeah, um, once, once the node's been cleaned, we can run some tests. It's, it's always great if you're using automation to use some tests um, to actually check that things are as expected. So the two types of tests that we have uh, is the burn-in tests. Um, so what that will allow you to do is just sort of run some kind of burn-in as a cleaning step. So that's, that's built into Ironic. Uh, we use the CPU and the RAM versions of that. Um, and then another, uh, another type of test we do is creating a test instance using Nova. And then why this is useful is uh, because basically if we, if we build a machine, I can build it onto either the tenant's network or a test network that looks pretty much the same as theirs. And then that allows us to build the bonds and make sure that everything works with the bonds because when you go into cleaning, you're only actually bringing up one side of the switch. So yeah, one of the downsides is if one side of your switch is down, you're probably cleaning, you're gonna get clean failed. But one of the good things with doing this test is that that instance looks exactly like what the user is uh, gonna, gonna get, receive on the other end. And then, um, and then when we hand it back, we just clean it and then we just put it into the available pool and then it's all ready. But these, stops, these steps are, are kind of optional. We turn them on for some resource, resource classes and we turn them off for others. Um, and it really depends on the use case. Like if we get a bunch of new hardware in, uh, and we just want to get it, get it in and get it enrolled really quickly. We might not want to spend like a day burning it, burning it in. But if we're repurposing some hardware, which is one of the things we've been doing with this move from like the Windows and the HD Condor, is we've been given a lot of hardware that we want to check for things like, like oh, is it actually working? Is it a bit flaky? Do we have disks in there that don't work that haven't been detected? So generally, I think if someone's going to give you a server, they're probably not going to do their due diligence to check whether it's ready for you. Um, so this, yeah, this is great. Uh, it's all built in and, and kind of works. So yeah, the creating the test instance isn't, um, we just use Ansible to do that. We just create an instance using Nova. It comes up. We check that um, we can get to its node exporter in Prometheus and that some parameters have been checked. If that happens, we're all good to go. And then what does that mean? It means everyone's got a better, a better meta server. It's time to go to the pub and we can all chill out. Well, what it actually means is we've done this. So we've just done the, We've just done the first part, um, and we don't need to worry about enrolling anymore. It's in. If it's all consistent, Ironic does do a very good job of looking after its lifecycle sort of management, and then it will move it between states as it's sort of handed back to us and back out to the user and back to us. And so it will go like cleaning, provisioning, active, cleaning, provisioning, uh, so cleaning, holding, and yeah, and so on. So then we can move on to the, the provisioning part. So at this point, we've enrolled the node. It's ready for the user. It's come up and it's, it's available. They can see it on their dashboards. They can check it in Prometheus, and they can see that they've got nodes available to build on. And then this is what we need them to know. So this is one of the great things about the using Nova in front of it is um, really for a user, they don't actually have to understand too much of the nitty gritty OpenStack stuff. That's kind of my role as a cloud engineer. Um, we, we're the kind of abstraction layer for them, and they come along, um, when they get onboarded to OpenStack, we're giving them a Git repo, which they can just push some Terraform code into, and then we have like automation in the back end to when that's peer approved and merged, it all goes and gets built in the cloud. So they need to know the flavor, the network, the AZ, and the image. Um, so really the only difference there for a, uh, between a VM uh, would, be, would be just the flavor. So if you're trying to repurpose a cluster from uh, like a VM to a bare metal node. It's one line change and then just throw it away and rebuild it and it will go. 
all the VMs will go, and then you'll have more capacity in your VMs, and then hopefully, as long as you've got some bare metal nodes on the other side, it will build. So the, yeah, the steps to, to provision a node are, um, so the user writes the Terraform codes, they specify the flavor, the network, the AZ, and Terraform will do that interaction with Nova, and then placement will reserve the bare metal node. Uh, Neutron will go in and configure the, the port, so it will log into it will log into the switch and it will it will move it um, to the provisioning network. Then we run some deploy steps to configure BIOS settings. So some users will have specific things, like sometimes they want hyper-threading on, sometimes they want it off. And to have two resource classes and make that static would be quite an, uh, quite a lot of operational overhead. Um, we don't really need a ticket just to turn one BIOS setting off, but what you can do with Ironic is you can use uh, deploy steps to actually go and run things at, at runtime. We don't do like the RAID config here, we could, um, but uh, yeah, we, we do things like BIOS settings and then all they need is they need a flavor with it on and a flavor with it off and they just use traits. Um, and then yeah, they can, they can even use the same machine. So one time they have it on, the next time they have it off, the deploy steps will kind of do that, do that for them. So the machine turn, has turned on, Neutron's done its thing and turned it to the provisioning VLAN. And then, uh, yeah, we stream the image down from Glance. Then when it's done, it reports back to the conductor and it says, yeah, I'm happy, um, I'm ready to go. And then Neutron will go and configure the port again. The server reboots, comes into the OS, and then the user can log in. So all the stuff I've spoke about is great, but how does it actually solve our technical issues? If it doesn't do that, then we've wasted a bunch of time and money. Uh, so Armada is, is our biggest use case for um, Ironic. Uh, Amada, if you, um, I can go into now. So yeah, Amada is a multi-cluster Kubernetes batch scheduler. Um, it distributes millions of batch jobs per day across thousands of nodes and many clusters. And then, yeah, Amada is fully open source and it's a CNCF uh, sandbox project. And then if you look at, the, look at the architecture of Amada, how it works is when you deploy Amada, typically, if you do this at a, a big scale, you can do this all on one node um, or one cluster if you want. But for the purpose of talking like thousands of machines, this is kind of the architecture you'd go for. So you deploy a, a Kubernetes cluster which would kind of serve the Amada API. And then this has the ability to push back, uh, batch jobs um, to lots of backend clusters. Um, that are separate from the API cluster. So if you see there, you've got at the front, you've got an Amada cluster. And in the back end, you've got three different, um, three different clusters. And then what that gives you is that gives you the ability to kind of scale out and add and remove capacity, rebuild the entire cluster without uh, taking out the main API. And then um, that doesn't affect the end users. It's completely invisible to them. So then typically we scale our Kubernetes clusters up to about 1,000 nodes. And then this approach works really well with the way that we've built the AZs in, and the conductor groups in Ironic because we build those up to about 1,000 nodes. Um, so typically we have like a one-to-one -one relationship with a full conductor group and, and a Kubernetes cluster. And then that allows us to yeah, go up to a full, like a full capacity. And then if we need to take out um, like a whole pod for maintenance or we need to rebuild a whole Amada cluster because it's going to move from one data classification to another, we just throw it away and then rebuild it, and then, yeah, I want it kind of fits in there. And then, so, uh, yeah, so the way this works uh, when we actually deploy Amada, although I'm not actually an Amada, uh, Amada guy, there are some people here I can point you in the right direction for, but I kind of, my understanding is that um, we, uh, we have Terraform, which builds the bare metal machine. The minimum set of configuration is passed through, um, through an ignition script, if it's using Flatcar, or like Cloud in it, if we're using Ubuntu. Um, and then that, what that gives you is that gives you a vanilla like uh, Kubernetes cluster with some kind of customizations with um, like so internal stuff. So it gives the ability for the users uh, for like service accounts to be able to log in and um, admins to do do the things that they need to do. And then we use a, a combination of uh, Jenkins and Argo CD to then go and apply Amada as like a kind of software stack on top of that. And then we have some internal tooling within GR, which will deal with uh, things like the, your data operations and your rebuilds and finding nodes that are older than like your 30 days and then marking those and draining those. And then, because uh, there's two kind of ways to, that we look at the rebuilds. We have, um, I need to take out cluster A because it needs, uh, it needs 
a firmware update or it's got a security patch and we're just going to throw it away and rebuild it. So we'd set that one as drain and then it would just drain the jobs. And then, yeah, when the last job's finished, it would report back and say we're ready to do it. And then we could just throw it away and rebuild it or just throw away a portion of the nodes if we wanted to. Um, and then there's this constant rebuild cycle that goes on and it looks for candidates um, out there. And that, that's just running constantly. Um, we used to use that with VMs as well, so it's kind of ported over. Um, and yeah, again, with the Nova in, in front of it, we, there's not too much, uh, there's not too much change there that's going on. Um, yeah, uh, so Amado is, is by far our biggest use case of Ironic, but it's not our only use case. Uh, we use things, uh, we, we deploy big data like Apache Spark and Hadoop uh, with Ironic. And then we've also started building our OpenStack hypervisors using Ironic as well, which is great because that allows us to drink our own champagne. Saying that, it does come with some pros and cons, of course, like everything. So yeah, the pros, let's go through those first. We have uh, increased stability for the GPU workloads. Now what that means is we, we got in a situation where we ended up with like a one-to-one -one mapping with hypervisors and a GPU node, which is using PCI pass-through to get the GPUs into it. Well, if anyone's done that before, they've probably realized that it's quite hard to then do anything on those nodes. Like when it comes to maintenance, we can't live migrate them because they've got a GPU attached. Um, and what's the point of having that extra sort of virtualization layer uh, when we don't need it? So that's one of the reasons we picked Ironic to move over to. And then that allows us to also use BGP peering between our worker nodes. Um, this, this is research, so we have a lot of high throughput um, applications and um, they need to get to like fast storage um, like behind them to pull out big data sets. Uh, so we can use Kubernetes uh, to allow some BGP peering between, between the nodes, which means we've increased our, our uh, overall throughput. And then, yeah, we, and we, we've got a simpler estate as well. So we've got fewer layers in the stack, bigger worker nodes. Maintenance becomes a lot easier. Um, we still love VMs or like the mixed sort of workloads. But the, where we sort of ended up with um, lots of kind of pets and things that aren't great for like a one-to-one -one mapping, like just having a hypervisor to run one VM is, is not optimal. Um, basically taking all that out and throwing it into Ironic is, is yeah, a really big pro. And then some of the cons, um, slower provisioning times. I mean, it's no surprise it takes a lot longer to turn on a server than it does to boot a VM. Um, more precise quota and capacity management. So quotas in Ironic are difficult. Um, we, um, we, we, do, we have a lot of internal dashboards which we use for capacity management. And as soon as you go and throw Ironic into that, um, it, it's kind of difficult because you have to give people quota in Nova. So it does make it easier for me because I work in a private cloud side uh, for the OpenStack stuff. And we sort of, generally the users aren't going to like do things they shouldn't. Um, they will try sometimes, but you could have a, you could have a quota for like a, a big bare metal machine. And then if you throw that away, you could go and make hundreds of VMs. And if we don't have the capacity for that, that's gonna cause us issues. Um, so yeah, um, they're a bit less flexible than the virtual machines. Obviously we can't live migrate things. If there's a failed dim in a, in a server, we have, to, we have to contact the user and say, can you turn it off? Or we're gonna turn it off, or can you drain it? Um, and yeah, we, we kind of find it tricky to mix and match the clusters. Uh, it's easier to just start from scratch. And to be honest, that was, that's more of a side effect of the work that Ironic has actually made it quite easy to do. Like, because we can just throw away a VM cluster and then we can just change, the burn, change like a, a flavor and just build it as bare metal, it's far easier to just not have to do the, the mixed workloads and try and get them across. And sort of the, the, when I talk about the mixed sort of use case, what that means is um, it's like having worker nodes on VMs and bare metal. Um, we, yeah, we had, we had a few like, sort of internal sort of issues. You probably could get it to work, but we sort of made it easy enough to, to not do that. And you can leave the old bare metal, bare metal cluster, uh, VM clusters there. They sit behind um, Amado and Amado will, Amado will schedule jobs to them. And then you just have your bare metal clusters when, uh, when you're ready to use them. Okay, so yeah, a couple of lessons learned. So uh, yeah, before the days of Terraform, um, we'd go in and we'd manually delete things. Where, uh, like you'd have like a traditional sort of sysadmin who'd go in, delete things, and then recreate them. And then that operation was pretty slow. Now when Terraform uh, and sim or similar tools came along, 
It doesn't actually leave any time before it does the, between the, uh, the delete and the create. As long as you've got an available pool available, you can do like a delete and a create, and then the node will just go through cleaning and then come out the other side. Um, so what we found is we found that some of the exceptions weren't being raised correctly, and then uh, when the node was failing, um, it wasn't actually trying, retrying on another node. So every time that like um, you try to reboot, uh, you try to build a server and you can't contact the BMC. What Ironic should do is it should pick another one from its candidates and it should try and try and uh, build on there. We're finding that that didn't work, um, but we yeah we we fixed it. We found well with a stack of the guys uh, with the help of the guys from Stack HPC, we might managed to fix that and uh, yeah push it back and yeah it's great sort of community collaboration collaboration. Once we did that. We unearth some more uh, sort of race conditions where you have a node um, that's active, and then you delete it, and then you rebuild some other nodes. In the meantime, placement will give you back those nodes in its allocations. So basically, Nova will say this is this is now gone, and then it will move to Ironic, and then Ironic will say I'm moving it to cleaning, and then Nova will then go and try and build on it, and then it will look like it's available to Nova, but then. Uh, but then Ironic will go, oh, I'm cleaning, and then it will throw an exception and it will come back up. And yeah, it kind of goes in this horrible sort of race condition cycle. Um, and what we did to fix that is you can just change the ordering of how it looks in placement so that Nova doesn't try and rebuild on, onto a node that's, that's been taken. Um, and yeah, once we did that, um, yeah, we, uh, yeah we, we're like a lot more successful. There's a couple of links on there if anyone actually uh, wants to see the work that we, uh, that we did in collaboration with Stack HPC to fix that. Um, we could probably do a whole presentation on that, so I won't, uh, I won't do that for now. And then, yeah, unfortunately, when you've done the stuff that I've been talking about for the last half an hour, um, this is just sort of the, the you're just sort of getting started. Uh, your day two operations are your next, are your next thing. And then we started uh, aggressively rebuilding all of our machines. Uh, and we wanted to work through the, the teething issues. We found that um, when we first started doing this, it was quite a lot of failures. Like we were doing this more than 28 cycle. We were just constantly rebuilding things. There wasn't much running on the on the clusters when we first started doing this. So we were just hitting it, rebuilding, rebuilding, rebuilding. And then we, we saw about a 25% failure rate for the first couple of weeks, um, which isn't great. I mean, you could say that 75% of the stuff worked, but 25% of it didn't. So um, yeah, so we had to we had to do quite a lot of work uh, to work out those teaming issues, and we found that it wasn't so much really uh, things were like ironic. It was uh, it was more like back end systems that we hadn't hit with like a thousand rebuilds at one time. So there were other like um, parts that we needed to scale out and work with vendors on like the the switches and like uh, like moving things and making sure that everything's happy, but. Rome really wasn't built in a day, um, and uh, yeah, a decent amount of effort from like cloud engineering and uh, the rest of the company. We managed to iron out a lot of those issues, and the the rebuild cycle, the 28 sort of 30 day rebuild cycle, largely just runs itself. Um, I, yeah, I've, I was literally not even like checking it or anything, and I, I looked on the dashboards like a couple of weeks ago, and yeah, noticed like that this is like rebuilding like stuff in the thousands um, every day and it, there's no, operator, no, no operational work that really needs to go on there. We have obviously failures, but we also have um, other pipelines which will then try and rectify things and like self-heal. So uh, if we have a node that's in clean failed, we have a pipeline which will find it and then it will retry a clean because sometimes there's intermittent issues like someone pulled a cable, someone was doing a bit of maintenance on like an OOB network or something like that and just a retry will fix it. Um, there's no need for us to really worry about it too much. Um, if it gets to the end of that and it hasn't managed to fix it, it will open us a ticket. Um, but yeah, it's just having, having things like consistency, good testing as it goes in, metrics to pull out, and like what looks normal for you is always good um, to kind of work out, like are things taking twice as long today than they were yesterday to go through cleaning? Like it really, just looking for like those kind of pointers. Um, doing things like that really sort of pays its dividends over time. And yeah, that, that's it really. Um, I think we're overrun, so I don't really have time for questions, but uh, yeah, feel free to grab me um, if you see me walking around, or if you want to know more about Amada, um, yeah, give us a shout. Well, thank you.